In 1969, Jun Takahashi was born in a small city about two hours north of Tokyo, Japan. All things considered, he came from relatively humble beginnings. His parents ran their own cleaning business, and other than school, there wasn't really that much for him to do. However, like most of the kids his age, Jun naturally gravitated towards popular culture, and the facet of popular culture that he became the most fixated upon was the emerging punk rock scene. The rebelliousness of punk rock provided an escape from his otherwise monotonous life, and while he may not have known it at the time, it actually changed the trajectory of his life. You see, the band that he was most enamored with was the Sex Pistols. They burst onto the scene with the release of their song God Save the Queen, which was so controversial that it actually got them banned from nearly every radio station in Britain. In an unexpected turn of events, banning the band from the radio made them more popular because it portrayed them as the archetype of what a punk rock band should be. They didn't care about following the rules, they cared about making music that provoked genuine thought and emotion, and that's why their work resonated with so many people. Now, one of the most important things to understand here is that the Sex Pistols were not only pioneers of punk rock music, but they were also pioneers of punk rock fashion. And for that, they have Vivian Westwood to thank. It was during the early 1970s that Vivian Westwood and her boyfriend Malcolm McLaren launched a punk-inspired fashion boutique that was quite literally called Sex. It was the perfect crossover of Vivian's passion for fashion and Malcolm's passion for music. And before long, punk fans from just about every corner of England were coming in to buy clothes. This included some highly talented musicians, and that set a light bulb off in Malcolm's head. In the past, he'd managed an American group called the New York Dolls, but they never amounted to much and eventually disbanded. After that, Malcolm shifted his attention back to the boutique, but his burning desire to be part of the music industry never fully subsided. And now, there he was, with some of the best punk artists in the world practically knocking at his door. With his mind made up, Malcolm recruited a handful of the boutique's customers and employees to form a band, and paying homage to the boutique, they decided to call themselves the Sex Pistols. Seeing as her store is the one that brought them all together, it was only fitting that Vivian was put in charge of designing their onstage outfits and directing their overall aesthetic. Now, this story is about Jun Takahashi, so why am I mentioning all of this? Well, like I said, Jun was a massive fan of the Sex Pistols, and the only thing he loved more than their music was the way that they dressed. So when he did his research and discovered that Vivian Westwood was the one behind it all, he became a massive fan of hers, and I guess you could even say that this is when he first fell in love with fashion. When he was old enough, he set out in search of like-minded individuals by enrolling at Bunka Fashion College in Tokyo. But upon arriving there, he quickly realized that it wasn't what he'd been expecting. Having learned from Vivian Westwood, Jun saw fashion as this youthful, rebellious art form. But most of his classmates were more geared towards traditional fashion and cared more about dressmaking than they did about ripped denim and graphic tees. This left Jun feeling dejected, but not defeated because the silver lining here was that he was now living in the heart of Tokyo. He knew deep down that there had to be other people like him out there, and all he had to do was go and find them. So that's exactly what he did. Jun started becoming involved in Tokyo's local nightlife, and he even joined a Sex Pistols cover band. It might sound like he was just out there having fun, and that was definitely a part of it, but this truly was a formative experience for him. For the first time in his life, he felt like he'd found his people, and one of the things that he paid particularly close attention to was what they were wearing. You see, Tokyo's nightlife scene was composed of the most fashion-forward people in the city, so he was not only exposed to punk fashion, but he was also exposed to the likes of luxury fashion and streetwear. For him, this was uncharted territory, but rather than shying away and sticking to what he already knew, he set out to learn more, and it was actually a Comme des Garçons show that forever changed the way he thought about fashion. He was not only inspired by the brand's effortless fusion of high-end fashion and streetwear, but he was also inspired by the brand's founder, Rei Kawakubo, who had been born and raised in Japan and was now taking the entire world by storm. She made him realize what was possible, and right then and there, he decided to launch his own brand. That was in 1990, so one year before he even graduated from college, but by that point, he'd acquired enough of a technical skill set to get started. He decided to name this new brand Undercover, and while it's obviously a cool name, the real question is why did he pick an English name instead of a Japanese name? I don't know for certain, but this too may have been inspired by Rei Kawakubo. 
One of the reasons that Ray picked the French name Comme des Garçons is because she wanted her brand to resonate with a French audience. Well, I think it's possible that June picked an English name because he wanted his brand to resonate with an English audience. And that would make sense, seeing as Vivian Westwood, an English designer, was his introduction to fashion. So anyways, he had the name picked out and was ready to get to work, but one thing that most people don't know is that he wasn't in it alone. During his time at Bunka, he became close friends with a fellow student named Hironori Ichinose. In its early days, Hironori played an important part in getting the brand up and running, but after that, he walked away to launch his own label. Since then, he's faded into relative obscurity, but I thought it'd be worth mentioning because the argument could be made that he was technically one of the brand's co-founders. Now, even though Jun and Hironori went their separate ways, there was another student at Bunka that Jun became quite close with. And that friend's name was Nigo. Much like June, Nigo's personal style was derived from his love of music. But the major difference between the two was that Nigo wasn't into English punk rock, he was into American rap music. And that led him down the path of streetwear and sneakers. Despite this difference, the two of them became close friends, and you could even say that their eclectic tastes in fashion helped broaden each other's horizons. Now, while they were still in school, Nigo landed a position as Hiroshi Fujiwara's personal assistant. In case you aren't familiar, Hiroshi Fujiwara is the legendary designer behind the label Fragment Design. As his personal assistant, Nigo would pretty much just help him out with whatever project he happened to be working on, and by way of their friendship, so would June. At this point in the story, Fujiwara had recently launched a new streetwear label called Good Enough, and it was a resounding success, but things were a little bit different for June. He'd been working away on the first undercover collection, but one important thing that he hadn't yet figured out was how and where he was going to sell the collection. He was starting from scratch with no following to speak of, so he didn't really know where to start. But then, Fujiwara had a great idea. He suggested that Jun and Nigo, his two young protégés, open up their own boutique so that way they could be a one-stop shop for brands like Good Enough, Undercover, as well as all of the other brands that they thought were cool. Jun and Nigo agreed to give it a try and picked out a storefront in Tokyo's Harajuku district. To put this into context, I could say that the Harajuku district is to Tokyo what Soho is to New York City, but that might not even do it justice. Nowadays, the district is flooded with storefronts for all of the biggest names in fashion, but back then, it was more like a gathering place for the local fashion crowd, and it had this truly organic, if you know you know status. They decided to name their store Nowhere, in reference to the Beatles song titled Nowhere Man, which again points to their shared love for Western pop culture. They officially opened for business in 1993, and from the outset, it was a raging success. Nowhere was essentially divided into two sections. On one side, customers could find Nigo's selection of streetwear, vintage sportswear, and footwear brands such as Nike and Adidas, while on the other side, customers could find June's selection of grungy, rock and roll inspired punk wear, and that included his own brand, Undercover. Although he was still technically working on his first formal collection, which we'll talk about in just a bit, he started releasing a handful of t-shirts, as well as some customized vintage pieces that were branded with the Undercover name. So, I know I said that the store was a raging success, and it was, but June and Nigo quickly realized that some products were selling better than others. And unfortunately for Nigo, it was his side of the store that wasn't doing so well. The pieces on June's side were flying off the shelves so quickly that they had trouble keeping up with the demand, and it just so happens that the best seller of all was Undercover. Taking note of this, Nigo started thinking of ways to generate more interest in his side of the store, and decided that he too needed to launch a brand of his own. As the story goes, he spent the next few days waiting for inspiration to strike, but none of the ideas that he came up with really seemed to click. Without thinking too much about it, he shared his dilemma with his close friend Skate Thing, who was a graphic designer that he'd actually been introduced to through Hiroshi Fujiwara. Well, not long after their conversation, Skate Thing happened to sit down and watch a marathon of the Planet of the Apes movies, and as soon as he was done, he rushed to tell Nigo that he'd found what they were looking for. The two of them sat down together as Skate Thing sketched out his idea, and the end result was the head of an ape with no discernible face. It had all happened relatively quickly, 
but this sketch would eventually become the logo of Nego's new brand called A Bathing Ape, or as it's more commonly referred to, Bape. I didn't mean to get too sidetracked there, but the point I'm trying to make is that if it hadn't been for the early success of Undercover, Nego may have never felt the pressure to start a brand of his own. And in that case, it's possible that Babe never would have existed. So in a very real sense, the launch of Nowhere changed streetwear forever, and Jun Takahashi played a central part in it all. But now, let's get back to the story, because as I was saying, all of this happened before Jun even released the first full Undercover collection. Thanks to the success of Nowhere, and to the success of the select few pieces that he'd already put out, Jun Takahashi was beginning to build a following. I wouldn't call it a large following just yet, but the insiders of Tokyo's fashion scene were starting to become more aware of his work. That said, the anticipation for his debut collection was starting to mount, and in 1994, at long last, the wait was over. He presented Undercover's fall-winter 1994 collection at Tokyo Fashion Week, and it was unlike anything anyone had ever seen before. The best way that I can describe it would be avant-garde streetwear but the short cut leather jackets and fishnet masks rounded it off with elements of punk wear as well. So in other words, it was as if June had channeled everything he loved into one concise high-end collection. The reason I say it was unlike anything anyone had ever seen before is because back then, streetwear and punk wear hadn't really made their way to the runway yet. But now, here was June fusing the two of them together while sprinkling in elements of traditional European and Japanese fashion. Even fans of Undercover were a bit surprised, because this was a far cry from the handful of t-shirts and customized vintage pieces that he'd released at Nowhere. For the first time ever, he was showing the full extent of his technical skill set, and to call it impressive would be an understatement. This collection got people talking, and with it, Jun Takahashi had officially put himself on the fashion industry's map. But before we dive a bit deeper into that, I want to talk about another brand that Takahashi launched in 1994 that you may not know about. Joining forces with his mentor Hiroshi Fujiwara, Jun decided to launch a new brand called AFA, which is short for Anarchy Forever, Forever Anarchy. The intention was to create a streetwear brand that catered to the punk crowd, but if I'm being honest, I'm not really sure why they thought this was necessary, because it's sort of what Undercover was already doing. If anything, I think it was supposed to be a slightly more reserved alternative, but I don't think they needed an entirely new imprint to do that. In any case, AFA did gain some traction in the local streetwear scene, but once the hype subsided, it became overshadowed by the success of Undercover, and people pretty much forgot about it. Not to get too ahead of ourselves here, but I feel like I should mention that Jun and Hiroshi would go on to revive their joint venture in 2009, this time under the name Assemble. However, this failed to gain any traction whatsoever, and to my knowledge, it is no longer active. Anyways, I just thought that'd be interesting to talk about, but now let's go back to Undercover. With his debut collection, Jun had gotten everybody's attention, and he wasn't about to let it go. One great example of this was his spring-summer 1996 collection titled Under the Cover, where he collaborated with the special effects artist Screaming Mad George to turn all of the models into monsters. As weird as it was, this proved to be the perfect way for him to present this dark, dare I say goth-inspired collection, and June had the foresight to know that it would work. Not to mention, this is the type of stuff that turns people's heads. Making intriguing collections is one thing, but presenting them in an intriguing way is a whole nother. Where a lot of designers go wrong here is they set out to make something intriguing, but end up drifting into the gray area of shock value and gimmicks. That was not the case for June. Even his most far out ideas were always intentional and served a real purpose for the collection. The overwhelmingly positive response to this collection in particular encouraged him to continue experimenting and taking risks. So in a way, this set the tone for many of June's collections in the years to come. For instance, in 1997, he was deemed the top new face in fashion by one of Japan's largest newspapers, thus solidifying his status as one of the country's most promising up-and-comers. Suffice to say that he was on the fashion industry's radar, and that included none other than Rei Kawakubo, the aforementioned founder of Comme des Garçons. Apparently, Ray had seen Undercover's fall-winter 1995 women's wear collection, and while this collection didn't receive quite as much press as the others, she saw his potential. She ended up following his work for a while, and then, one day, sent him a letter saying that she was a fan. 
As I'm sure you can imagine, that was a surreal moment for June, because as we discussed earlier, it was a Comme des Garçons show that motivated him to start undercover. This was a true full circle moment, and after that, the two of them kept sending letters back and forth. They'd still never met in person, but that was about to change. Because one day, in 2002, Ray invited June to present a women's wear collection at Paris Fashion Week. As exciting as it was, the thought of this was daunting. This was going to be his international debut, and many people consider Paris Fashion Week to be the main stage. The lights don't get much brighter than that. And while he was confident in his abilities, he knew that it wasn't going to be easy. Would the European market find his out-of-the-box approach too weird? Would his success in Japan translate overseas? There was a lot to consider, and to be honest, there was a lot of room for error. But he wasn't going to let that stop him. June went to Paris, and the night before his show, he and his team met Rei Kawakubo and her team for dinner. Once they'd all gathered, Rei, who is known to pick her words very carefully, raised her glass and proposed a toast, saying, to the beginning of June's fight in Paris. The moment of truth had finally arrived. Fans and fashion editors alike filed into their seats to see Jun Takahashi present his spring-summer 2003 women's wear collection. Many of the people in the audience that day weren't quite sure what to expect from this newcomer, and I think it's fair to say that many of them were skeptical. But the moment that first model stepped onto the runway, those doubts were cast aside. Looking back now, this collection, known as the Scab Collection, may very well be the most important in Takahashi's career. It was the epitome of high fashion punk wear. Clusters of hand-sewn patches scattered throughout the garments gave the impression that they'd seen legitimate wear and tear. In fact, these patches were meant to look like scabs, which is how the collection got its name. To take this a step further, the frayed hems and distressed fabrics made it seem as if the pieces were literally falling apart right there on the runway. The color palette was mostly black and white, but June cleverly used stitching and dangling seams to mix in some yellows, reds, and blues. To be honest, all of the pieces were brilliant, but I'd have to say that the real stars of the show were the pants. To create these, June stitched so many different pieces of fabric together that it resulted in this cool stacking effect. These reconstructed pieces would become one of the brand's staple offerings in the years to come, and nowadays if you want to buy a pair from the original Scab collection, they're going for thousands and thousands of dollars. So objectively speaking, this collection was very well executed, but what really left a lasting impression on the audience that day was how the show ended. Just when everyone thought it was over, the models walked back onto the runway wearing an array of colorful burkas, and this presented a thought-provoking dichotomy. Traditionally, burkas are a religious garb that are meant to cover the faces and bodies of the people who wear them, but these bright and colorful burkas were obviously designed to attract attention. You can come up with your own interpretation of why June decided to include this in the show, I guess that's sort of the point, but from my perspective, this was his way of saying that someone who is quite literally undercover can still express themselves through fashion. I don't think that he was trying to challenge any ideologies, but I'm sure that he knew it would start a conversation, and it certainly did. Nevertheless, none of this detracted from the collection itself, and if anything, it further fueled the narrative that June had arrived onto the fashion scene and didn't intend to play by anybody else's rulebook. As I alluded to earlier, the Scab Collection is arguably the most important in Undercover's history, and that's because it marked the beginning of the brand's international expansion. It was after this show that some of the biggest fashion retailers in the world started reaching out to June because they wanted to sell Undercover in their stores. Making it onto the shelves of these stores not only gave the brand more exposure, but it provided an additional stream of revenue that June could now use to fund even bigger and better projects. Beyond that, this collection cemented Undercover's spot on the Paris Fashion Week schedule, and I don't want to understate how significant that is. Remember, Rei Kawakubo had warned June that he'd have to fight to make it in Paris, and after just one collection, he'd won that fight. Make no mistake, there was still a lot of work to be done, but his foot was now in the door, and there was no turning back. Over the course of his next few collections, June continued proving that he deserved to be talked about in the same breath as some of the biggest names in fashion. To put it simply, he was finally getting the recognition that he deserved. 
For a long time, people referred to Undercover's dedicated fandom as a cult following, but it eventually got to a point where it was so big that it felt like everyone knew about it. And because June had a reputation for coming up with some of the most original ideas, tons of other brands were vying for an opportunity to work with him. One of the first brands that he collaborated with was Bape. Getting the chance to make something with his longtime friend and business partner Nigo was yet another full circle moment. They'd met each other years before at Buka Fashion College with no idea what the future held for them. And now, there they were, both running highly successful brands of their own. They settled on making a shoe that combined undercover signature silhouette with Bape's signature print, and as a nod to their beginnings, they featured the logo of their store Nowhere on the toe box. So the collab with Bape was obviously a personal one for June, but that was just the beginning. In 2009, the same year that these shoes came out, June began working with Nike as well. This was actually a joint collaboration where Undercover worked with Hiroshi Fujiwara's Fragment Design to reimagine Nike's Match Classic HF. It's a fairly low-key silhouette, so it sort of flew under the radar, but the point is that this was the start of Undercover's relationship with Nike. The following year, in 2010, they took things a step further by giving June his own athletic wear line called Gyakusu. Gyakusu, which is the Japanese word for running in reverse, was a dream come true for June, because he happens to be an avid runner. So through this collab line, he gets to work with Nike to create the type of running gear that he himself wants to wear. In addition to this, there have also been several collaborations between Undercover and Nike, where June has reimagined some of Nike's most popular models, including the Air Max 720s, the React Element 87s, and the Overbreaks, just to name a few. To be clear, I believe that these collabs between Undercover and Nike are technically separate from the Gyakusu line, but whichever way you want to look at it, the important thing to understand here is that Jun Takahashi has a very close relationship with Nike, and even today, they work together on a regular basis. Speaking of brands that Jun works with on a regular basis, there have also been several collabs between Undercover and Supreme. The first was in spring 2015, and almost every piece from the collab became an instant streetwear classic. There was the Anarchy is the Key trench coat, the all over hand print hoodie, the teddy bear graphic, and my personal favorite, the Wicked Witch of the West box logo tee. Undercover was already wildly popular in its own right, but this was back when the hype behind Supreme was at an all time high. So the demand for these pieces was absolutely insane. Based on the success of this first collab, it was a no-brainer for the two brands to continue working together. They've now done so a handful of times, with the most recent being the Public Enemy collection from 2018, and the response is always overwhelmingly positive. Now, in addition to streetwear brands like Bape and Supreme, as well as athletic brands like Nike, Jun Takahashi has opted for a range of casual wear and luxury wear collabs as well. Most notably, Undercover has an ongoing partnership with the casual wear brand Uniqlo, and on the other end of the scale, the brand partnered with Valentino a few years back on their fall-winter 2019 collection. I think all of this just points back to the fact that Jun Takahashi has such a diverse skill set. I mean, he can literally draw inspiration from just about anywhere. For instance, he referenced iconic Stanley Kubrick films in three collections over the course of just two years. His spring-summer 2018 collection referenced The Shining, his fall-winter 2018 collection referenced 2001 A Space Odyssey, and his fall-winter 2019 collection referenced A Clockwork Orange. It's almost as if he was tapping into these different universes and saying, okay, what would the most fashionable people in these universes wear? And as someone who loves these movies, that was such a cool concept. I mean, Jun Takahashi's creativity is truly on another level. His mind is like a factory of original ideas, and each one is better than the last. Just think about it. It's been almost 30 years since he first launched Undercover, and somehow, someway, he's still getting better. I think that a large part of this can be attributed to the fact that he's always looking to try new things and explore the unknown. There are a lot of designers out there that find a few design elements that work for them and then try to ride the same wave for as long as possible. But June actively steps outside of his own comfort zone time and time again because he understands the long-term benefit to his development. And that right there is why undercover shows are among the shows that I look forward to the most. You never know what to expect, but that's what makes them so fun. 
to wrap things up here, I just want to say that Jun Takahashi is such an important figure in modern fashion, and he's someone that I encourage all of the aspiring designers out there to look up to. His ability to blend styles, his willingness to experiment, and his understanding of how to present new ideas have allowed him to rise to the top of this fiercely competitive industry. And the best part of all is that he's showing no signs of stopping. So that's all for this episode. It's one that I got a lot of requests for, so hopefully you enjoyed it. And if you did, please remember to like, comment, subscribe, and as I said in the beginning, go sign up for the Patreon if you want exclusive content and early access to videos like these. Other than that, thank you for watching Threducation, and I will see you next time.